Once upon a midnight dreary, while I wait, that's been done. Darkness falls across the land. No, oh, I've done that way too many times already. Oh, I'd never given much thought to how I would die. Oh, forget it. You, my friends, are listening to panelology. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Oh, forget it. <laughs> Welcome to episode 233 of Panelology. I'm Alex. I'm Megan. And I'm Jenna. What? Yes. What? Huh? What a twist! Who? Who's that? Who's this person? Blast the from Halloween the miracle. pretty recent past. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, look, <laughs> June was like 10 years ago. We're fine. Time means nothing. It really doesn't. So many things have happened since June. Yeah. It's a Cocktober miracle. <laughs> I love how I'm like... That's a more appropriate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love how I'm like, I'm going to take a little time off for mental health in 2020. <laughs> the uh -huh. best decision sure. I made in 2020 was finding a therapist that I love. Oh, good. I should do that. That is how I survive. I just uh, avoid my family, and that's been helping me, honestly. Yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. I deleted my Facebook account and replaced the bookmark on my bookmark bar with a link to the panda cam for Zoo Atlanta. That is probably the most <laughs> healthy thing I've ever heard, by the way. Yes. Well, I mean, other than Meg finding an actual good therapist. I mean, that yes. Is, that, is, you know. that is the legit good thing. <laughs> Alex's is like the thing that I would actually do. I, I feel like that is actually incredibly healthy and like, because you did this on your own. Yeah. I don't know what you call that movement, that arm movement. <laughs> Golly gee, good, good old job. Pal. <laughs> That's it, yes. <laughs> uh, but we are all acceptable for 2020, yes? Yes. 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 I'm not going to say good, but acceptable. There is, I've seen it like a hundred times already this month, and it has made me laugh every single time, but it is this Brooklyn Nine-Nine moment where Jake goes something like jot this down on may 14th jot this down and gina goes oh honey we're in the middle of october <laughs> and he's like really and i'm like yeah i feel that every single time that is <laughs> that is real i've enjoyed the pope meme that has been all over twitter this week have you seen that no Which so pope? it's a picture of, i assume the current pope his <laughs> holiness I mean, there's a hot pope i think on like what hbo maybe what? this is IRL Pope? The two popes, oh, okay. the young pope, the pope pope. Yeah. Um, Andrew Scott, who's not a pope, but that is what I think of every time. Olivia Pope? No, you went too far. Okay. <laughs> well, there's a first time it's for everything. Too far. <laughs> Olivia Pope is too far. But it's this picture of him holding something in his hands that Twitter has taken and divided into quadrants and replaced the quadrant that is whatever was in his hands with whatever image you want to put in it. <laughs> Oh, um, no. And I know how you love those. It does amuse me. I, I have not yet done the one that always pops to my mind, which is him holding a straight edge razor blade. <laughs> Very Sweeney Todd. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Oh. I do think my favorite is the one that takes the three images and infinitely regresses them in his hands so that it forms like a golden spiral. <laughs> that one's pretty funny. I think I think Kieran Geller or Jamie McKelvey one retweeted that one. I think it was McKelvey. McKelvey's retweeted a bunch of them. Um, but those have brought me a source of have have been a source of delight this week. That was good to hear. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that Meg can track the amount of times I've been on social media by when I like a photo of hers. <laughs> like that's it. I did see that this week, and that's I was like, it. <laughs> when I like, I thought about you and I summoned you. <laughs> yeah. Every time I get, I'm like, oh, Meg did something cute. <laughs> oh, that's it for a month. Bye. Have you <laughs> been? Have you seen the pictures of Furiosa? I have not. Oh my god. I feel like I should derail this podcast and just send you a bunch of pictures <laughs> of the dog that is not mine yet. Red and I are still coming up with a game plan for that. Okay. Oh, wait. Is this Tim's dog? This is Tim's okay, dog. Okay. Then I have... Ab yeah. Okay. I forgot that yeah. that was the name. <laughs> I just call it so the cute baby. I that. 
That's you, baby. I call her Fury for the most part because she is a terror. <laughs> so, in the best way possible. Aww. Prior to his listening to this episode, did Tim know that you and Red were conspiring to steal his dog? <laughs> Tim is fully aware I, that we are conspiring to steal the dog. If you see anyone's face when looking at this dog, you know they're conspiring to steal this dog. I mean, I have Literally, met this dog. This dog chewed on my foot until she fell asleep nuzzled against it. So That's fucking adorable. At least she wasn't fucking your foot. I, yeah, not yet. And I whose mean, dog did that, Jim? I mean, <laughs> look. And to be fair, he wasn't. He was going after your boss's dog and miss. <laughs> We're talking miss about comics now. Okay. The same joke to Tim three times in one day about stealing his dog. And even the third time, I was like, game night's canceled. As I'm holding Fury in my arms, he's like, what? What do you mean it's canceled? I'm like. This is the third time I've made this joke today. It's not that good. <laughs> hey, you better watch out, because the last time I joked about stealing a dog, uh, I got it. Oh, no. So, I didn't steal it. Oh, no. I didn't steal it. But I, well. but I did get it. Yeah, one night we're leaving rehearsal, and Jen says, I want to go get Duncan, and talking about stealing a dog, and I think, is there a donut place open this late? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just a cute puppy boy. Oh, anyway, comics. Comics. We're here for comics. comics. Sorry. This no. is our longest cold open in years. <laughs> I haven't been here in forever. I have to talk about everything. It's true. Uh, something is killing the children. We have talked about this before, yes. but I don't think the three of us have talked about this before. Feels like you know, old times. I was wondering if the first issue came out around last year's Spooktacular, because I well, feel like we did mention it. This is part of why I wanted to open with this one. We talked about number one in last year's Spooktacular, and now two full arcs are out. Yeah. Two arcs are out? Shit, I'm behind. Is it really two? I don't, I don't think the second trade has come out yet. I thought there the, were only the seven arc. issues. Did I miss an issue? Ten. There are ten issues. Mm. There are ten issues? Mm. I missed Lord, three. I so behind. Mm. Oh, wait. I actually said that earlier that I ten, had 12. Hang on. I can check. Three. <laughs> it's not that important. All that we need to know is that we're behind. And we need to catch yeah, up. Yeah, because it's so good. Yeah, number 11 comes out this week. God. I can't. Every time both Second and Charles and Dr. Nose do not have this trade. Like, I have the trade on Comixology. But this is but, one that you need on your shelf. Yeah, this is one I want on my shelf. And it's like. <laughs> I don't want <laughs> to turn I mean, I'll to find Amazon. It. No, definitely don't want to do that. But also. <laughs> I mean. I'm sure Dr. Nose would order it for you, yeah. if not Oxford will. Yeah. There is this, like, strange thing about, like, finding it out there. <laughs> right. That's Which, true. We've talked again, about that. Again, Pokemon. Yeah. And I said this to someone, like a store owner this week, and they, like, laughed at me and thought I was the most ridiculous person. And I was like, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> this is how I live my life. <laughs> it works. That's with me and most Funkos. Like, I don't, I don't want to right? order them really unless, unless it's an exclusive and there's no other way to get it. Exactly. And I have yes. to have it. But if I want it, then I want to find it out in the wild. That's what, like, it tells me I should have it at that point. <laughs> I think it was about <laughs> Toilet Ninjas. That's why. That's who... I think it was the Think Geek people. They were like, you could probably... No, it was at Hot Topic. They were like, we sell these online. And I'm like, no, half the fun is going and finding these in stores. It's not the same. Finding them in the wild. Yep. And they were like, that's ridiculous. And I'm like, well, I found seven of them today. You can get over Shut them. up, you stupid millennial. <laughs> oh, wait. Shit. We have a millennial. So did you end up ordering that infamous Iron Man Funko Pop I linked you to? <sighs> no, but I might... It's still up Mine there. Came in. It looks very nice. Really? I have not uh -huh. gotten my Iron Heart yet. When does she? My that's Iron... November. My... November. It's November, yeah. right? Okay. That's right. We're my good. Iron Heart has not shipped yet. Okay. Um, that was a pre-order. Yeah. The Shit's Creek ones were on Amazon for like twenty something bucks, and I found those in the wild. Okay. After like debating it repeatedly for the like twelve dollar, ten dollar range. Yeah. Plastic Empire normally has I the things that I can't find. I <laughs> yes. I Excuse shouldn't me, have please. told you about Plastic Empire, <laughs> should I? Not, no. Oops. I've only been once. Mostly because I'm afraid they're going to have more Toilet Ninjas, and I'm on the hunt for those right now. <laughs> I'm at some point going to have to look up what a Toilet Ninja is. Oh, I will send you a picture of mine. <laughs> so something is killing the children. Yes. Yes. Our favorite Which... book about monster hunters, hunting monsters that kill children. Indeed. I love her whole aesthetic. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. Like, it is a cosplay that I am, like, keeping in the back of my mind. Oh, yeah. I want to find a group and do, like, the whole family. Oh, yes. And I'll be anyone someone... from that family. I don't care. <laughs> I want someone to dress up as the octopus. <laughs> It'd be so cute. But wait, as the little octopus dude or dress up as the creepy spirit that comes out of it? And then have the octopus, like, in front of it. Yes. Mm-hmm. Or both. Like, your right foot is the octopus, and the rest of you is the spirit? Yes. Yes. That'd be cute. So I've only read the first arc, so I'm, I get, I think, probably slightly behind both of you. But I like this whole invisible monsters thing. Yeah, that's terrifying. Like, that you have to, like, impale someone's head so they can see it. Children are creepy enough than to have, like... <laughs> The only children can see these monsters? No, thank you. Yeah. No, no thanks. Yeah, like, and Go ahead. As I say, in the second arc, we see more of the society that Erica comes from, the, the group of monster hunters, and how much she is not down for just the wild bureaucracy of it. Mm, yeah, you can definitely... She's, she's very punk. Yes. Yes. And I get, I, you get that feeling oh, yeah. in the first arc, yeah. Um, I like when she's shopping for weapons. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, let's find you the really nice one. She's like, no, I want that crappy one you just talked about. That one sounds dangerous. Let's go with that. I appreciate the sheriff who just, like, hates that he constantly has to go with all of it, but has no better answer, so he still goes with all of it. He's just, like, so over this shit. Yes. <laughs> but he's like, god damn it. I don't know that there's a whole lot more to say about the book because it's actually really difficult, I think, to talk about in terms of beat by beat. I mean, I'm, you can generalize and say the plot is about a small town, the first arc at least, a small town where kids start dying and going missing. And someone yeah. comes to town to fix that. And it's a young girl, and she's a badass, and I love her. Erica Slaughter is the I best. I want that mask. This book could not have come out at a better time from the standpoint of that mask. I mean. Like, you, I need it. Yeah. You, you know they sell. As, I figured they did. Haters. But I finished this last night at about 1230 mm. and was like, that is a note I'm going to make for tomorrow that I just remembered right now. Yeah. So. <laughs> when I edit this, I'll find the link and send it to you. Okay. <laughs> if I f- have forgotten by that point again. Yeah. <sighs> Moving on. Uh, we have a pair of the Hill House books on the list here. Basketful of Heads and The Low, Low Woods. Yes. Where- Which one do we want to do first? Yeah. Let's start with Basketful of Heads. Cool. This one is so Stephen Kingy. Yeah. Joe Hill wrote this one, right? Yep. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, right down to all of the Stephen King references, especially in the first issue. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about him constantly doing this. Making references to Stephen King books? Yeah. Because <laughs> it kind of feels like, hey, you know who my dad is? My dad is this guy. Isn't it, it cool? It kind of does. And, like, I've read enough of his work that, like, I feel like his work can stand up on its own, but, like, fine. Oh, it does. Yeah, absolutely. So, it, and I guess because I just didn't know Sferatu and had this, like, this was one of the issues that I had with the book. Um then I'm just like, man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't love that. But I did love this comic. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. it's slightly predictable in some aspects, mm-hmm. but I loved it. I mean, June is fantastic. Oh, yeah. Yes. June and her ex. Yes. She cray. I mean, understandably. Yeah. Yeah. I think she's earned that. Yeah, I got a bunch of people coming after me. You're going to see how cray. Yeah. And everyone is lying to me about everything constantly. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and also I'm going to get sexually assaulted in some ways and physically assaulted in others. This is fun. Yeah. Yeah. The the one thing that I don't love about this book is about halfway through, we get a lot of backstory for another character who has committed suicide before the series begins. And there is just so much trauma visited upon this character without any, like, chance to do anything or affect the story. Oh, yeah. But it almost feels like it borders on gratuitous, too. Yeah. I'm I'm not sure I understand the point of her character at all. Like, she's the catalyst that kind of starts all this, but there are other ways to develop that. Yeah. For sure. 
I mentioned it just because I think one, it's good to have a heads up going in that that's part of what's yeah, going on here. Absolutely. But two, just like, you know, a little bit mixed bag, as good as June is, it does have some issues. Um, June is great. Mm. And that axe is great. Also, uh, uh, Roberta, Bobby, had this wild Phyllis Diller energy in the first issue <laughs> that I was really into. <laughs> Like, she even looks a little like the way Phyllis Diller is drawn on the Scooby-Doo episode that Phyllis <laughs> Diller is in. And it's set in the 70s, and I don't know, for whatever reason, for the rest of this book, I read That's that character as Phyllis Diller. I mean, so maybe that was intentional. Yeah. I kind of hope so, yeah. honestly. Now, she wasn't part of the plot, right? Um, like, I couldn't get a read on whether or not she was part of the whole situation. The... I I don't think that she was directly involved with the plot to kidnap the boyfriend. What's his name? Right. <laughs> yes. What's his name? But Liam. Is it, I think I think it. it is Liam. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But at the end, when we get the answer to. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. When when we get the answer to who has who has accidentally set all of this in motion. Yeah. It is because of her. Mm. That's true. Um, yeah. I love the art in this, too. Oh, yeah. I was just about to say that. Like, that that really good feel of, like, the Northeast summer comes through in this. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and the 70s setting. The artist on this is Liam X. Um, like, like it, it is... It feels... Expressive. Yeah. It feels vintage and grainy and textured, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, even... Even the lettering has that vibe to it. Like, the lettering feels like typeface or handwriting in in a prop from something from the 70s, yeah. right? Like, it's yeah. got that kind of... Just regular enough to be, like, a little more mass-produced, but still not consistent in the way we would see something now, right? Yeah. How about the low, low woods? Oh, boy. How do you I love describe this. this crazy weird book? I love this. This book is not for everybody. Yeah. Oh, it, no. <laughs> yeah. I would probably go as far as to say that this is maybe the best written thing I read for this episode. Mm -hmm. But I think it does come with a hefty amount of content warning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which, if you know anything about the author, who I'm totally blanking on who wrote this, Carmen Maria Machado. Um put out a collection of short horror stories i think two years ago that like went around a group of my friends and when i got to it i was like oh this is not the kind of horror i love <laughs> this is horrific and it is all very much in the same kind of vein as lolo woods and it still didn't hit me as i started lolo woods that this was probably going to also be in the same vein yeah uh yeah that one's dark yeah, this is also set in the past in a small town uh, that is a former mining town where the mines are now just permanently on fire. Which is a real thing. Yes. yes. It's not the same place, but it's like a that's actually happening. Yeah. It's uh, also got like magical realism like from the beginning. Yeah. It's a very like low key amount of it, but like there's chatter about the witches and having to go into um having curfews and stuff because of like magical shit just happening whatever yeah. yeah shit gets weird if you don't go home on time yeah that's just the thing yeah everybody knows also you know like every small town has a witch they don't hold on well well i would argue <laughs> that they do oh they definitely do but the way There's that a it's bit presented of... having grown up in a very small town and had <laughs> been there earlier today i would say they do <laughs> there is a bit of narration around the witch that i love i think it's like issue three maybe issue four um i think it's v narrating and she's like yeah this may sound like a real deus ex machina oh hey there's magic that solves all your problems but magic has been around how long and how fucked up is the world still yeah That's tell true. me it solves all your problems. right yeah um maybe it causes your problems mm -hmm. i i do like at the core of this it is um a story about best friends mm -hmm. and I'm going to say female empowerment, knowing that that is going to make a lot of people go, Oh no, never mind. But it really kind of is, but more of, I guess like 
female empowerment about owning your trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And deciding the healthiest way for that, for you to deal with that. It's not, it maybe not be the same for everybody else. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what the entire history of this town turns on is someone made a decision for everyone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and also, there just might be people that, you know, eventually become a black hole. That's terrifying. <laughs> that's terrifying. <laughs> when you maybe get too happy. Ah, it's good. It's good I stay sad. I see. <laughs> <laughs> keep that low level anxiety in place. <laughs> low level you're adorable <laughs> i text alex this morning and i was like look i can't believe what's happening but i'm so hoarse from like anxiety crying oh i'm so sorry it's okay it's totally cake emergencies look. will do that <laughs> 2020 i mean anxiously crouched at the starting line <laughs> Yes. I I just am cake. <laughs> <laughs> Hence the mandatory short skirt and long jacket. It's true. Oh, I need that kind of season, man. Yeah, my my heat kicked on for the first time today. I was like, what is that sound? <laughs> yeah, I put on a flannel and I don't do that. Mm. I hate I, being hot. But it was I dug out my house morning. slippers <gasps> earlier this what? week. Oh, I forgot I have house slipper slippers. I just have big cushy socks. My mom was like, "Yeah, I had to kick on the heat for the dogs. They were shivering." And I was like, <laughs> "I looked at Charlie, who's under two blankets and kind of used to the fact that like the radiator just doesn't kick on." And I was like, "I'm sorry, bud. We're not kicking on the heat today. It's not <laughs> happening. It's not that cold yet." He's probably like, "Mom, we're from New York. It's fine." Yes. <laughs> like, there's still a window open in the house because I'm like, "Man, this fresh air feels good." Yeah. <laughs> Last thing for me on Lolo Woods. Yes. yes. The artist Danny, who is also the artist on, uh, oh shoot, the Dan Waters book that I love. Oh, were we just talking about this the other day? No, um, okay. different book. Uh, we talked about it recently on the podcast. I talk about it every time it comes out, oh, no. but I'm blanking on the title. Um, one of my favorite artists who kind of has popped up out of nowhere for me in the last couple of years. I was not used to seeing her on anything, and then suddenly she's on this, and she's on that Dan Waters book, and I think she's got some DC stuff coming up. Nice. Like, just kind of everywhere, and I really dig this, like, almost sketchy, a little messy, but still very representative art style. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a really good balance in it that I think is really flexible and great for horror. Yeah, absolutely. I also like the potential of, like, because the magic realism exists, because there's so much that's gone on in this town, this is, like, one of the stories. Because, um, did you get to her father having issues and that whole storyline? No. Part of it, Jenna? No. Okay. So, slight spoiler, um, which, it's not the main issue, um, but it, it's why they go to talk to the witch is because the witch owes, I think it's V's mom a favor. Yeah. And I'm like, for what? <laughs> That's now the comic that I want. Yeah, right? I want to know what led- to that um the witch having to owe her mom something. yeah yes coffin bound is the other danny book by the way okay. oh yeah. yeah yeah i i would definitely read another book set in the history of this town 100 percent. oh yeah yeah i no, need definitely. i need like several i need a little universe of this town because yeah. i'm so intrigued by all of it yeah like I, to go back to basketball heads like these are both really small towns with such cool different vibes where it's like basketball heads is just a really corrupt more mainstream field town and it's like i got everything i need there mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i mean well this... i mean also it's so stephen king like you know it you know yes. this town you've been yes. to this town 20 times in movies and books yes and that book is so like structural in terms of it's basically a mystery that is kind of horrific that has this one fantastical element. Yeah. Right. And like the actual mystery building, everything you need is there and contained in this and you can see all the breadcrumbs. Like it doesn't ask for anything more than what is in those seven issues to exist. Yeah. Right. Or is this, this like, yes. there's a whole history. Yes. Mm -hmm. There's so much more that I need to know. Maybe yeah. someday. 
I hope so. Jin. Me. Tell us about Philadelphia. Oh boy. Yes, Ooh, please. Oh boy. Oh boy, Alex, I had I done did I done did you dirty. <laughs> Cause you asked me which book you should read and I told you the wrong one. It should have been this one. <laughs> it's so fucking good. Philadelphia yeah. is about vampires. Shit. <laughs> it's about a a beat cop who works in I think he works in Maryland, uh, who has to come back to Philadelphia for his father's funeral, his father being a homicide detective. Turns out his dad had discovered a nest of vampires and straight up got killed by them. Oh, shit. And then shit gets crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I love when that is used where it's like, you thought that was bad. There is this whole entire plot from the vampires and the leader of the vampires is someone very important. Oh, and then there's this young kid vampire who's so cool and he like kicks everybody's ass and I love him. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, this book. This book. Oh my god. You just mm, mm, and there's mm. I want to tell you so many things Alex cuz you in particular need to know them, but I don't want to tell you because I don't want to ruin it. I will it's read it. It's so good. How far into this is this? Like how many trades are out? Uh, I don't know. I've only read the like, first one. Okay. Because, like, I know I have the first issue. I must have grabbed it. Either it was, like, one of those moments where it was, like, one per customer, or maybe it was around the time that I was coming on Panelology. Because there was, like, a good chunk of time where I was, like, just grabbing first issues and stuff. And I know I didn't read it, but I saw it recently as I went through single issues trying to figure out where the hell to put comics in my apartment. And, yeah. No. Very, very glad to hear that this is good and going to need to get back into it. I think it's only one volume okay holy Sweet. shit no no hold on it can't be it's so good there has to be more after this <laughs> okay no there's more okay. maybe they're in the second yeah they are okay oh it's so good it's so good oh that reminds me guess what i found yesterday at second intro what a used first volume of american vampire <gasps> nice very excited i love that book oh this book is so good if you if you love Founding Fathers, Alex, you'll love this book. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, please tell me Benjamin Franklin is a vampire. Are you telling me Alexander Hamilton is a I'm vampire? Not telling oh, you, no. I'm not telling you anything. I'm just saying if you love Founding Fathers, you're going to love this book. Oh, you know what? That motherfucker Aaron Burr, he's totally a vampire. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I do know. <laughs> yeah, I was say, you, you do. You're gloating. I see you doing <laughs> that dance. I think you're really going to like this book. Cool. I will, I will, I will read it. <laughs> Razor Blades. I tried so hard to get anyone I'm else to so read this. I'm so sorry. Aww. It's all good. I just have the Pink Spider song in my head. Hey, hey, so, little Razor Blade. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a comics horror anthology that is being published quarterly. The editors on it are James Tynan IV and Steve Fox. Uh-huh. Uh, and it is... Tynan's brainchild uh, he talks about this in in sort of the the letter at the front of the first issue but basically he had saved Alan Moore's from hell like throughout his comics reading life as this break glass in case of emergency comic book read so we're in 2020 and COVID happened <laughs> and the glass oh, is broken yes. okay so he broke the glass <laughs> And in reading that and in going back and picking up the horror anthology that it was a part of, he had this thought of, I'd, I'd like to edit a horror anthology and messaged Steve Fox to talk him into it. And they talked each other into it and <laughs> it has become a real thing. Uh, the second issue of this goes on sale, in fact, the day this episode comes out. Oh, nice. Um, if you're listening early in the morning at noon. Um, the first issue, they put out a physical copy of, like, 500 copies, and it sold out in 40 minutes. Oh. Um, you can still get it, uh, digitally, pay what you want, at readrazorblades.com. Um, and I think they've talked about doing another physical release of the first issue, something that comic shops can carry, because a bunch of comic shops were interested in it, too. The the people who they have gotten involved in this book is just a wild list of creators. Um, so the first issue starts with 
a story called The Washing Machine called James, uh, by James Tynan and Andy Bellinger uh, about a man at like a rundown motel who is approached by a woman who asks him to reach for something in a washing machine. Then he blacks out and looks in the washing machine and her body is in there. Shit. Damn and it, he no. kind of has a breakdown. Regret. Um, there is a story called Local Heroes by Marguerite Bennett and Werther Delandera. That one's about a man in the park who is, like, watching his kid in a stroller, and the stroller gets snagged, and because his wife is a black woman, no one believes the child was his and think he's trying to steal it. Oh, no. Mm -mm. Uh, there is a short story written by Danny Lohr, who is a frequent co-collaborator with Vita Ayala. One of Michael Walsh's sort of like, uh, this is this is a quarantine project that he has taken on, uh, where he started drawing like a dream journal, basically, of the weird nightmares he's been having in quarantine. Oh. Uh, and he calls it Sleep Stories. There's an excerpt from that in here. Terrifying. Uh, a Nick Robles <gasps> pinup just called The Weaver. You got me. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a story in here by Steve Fox with art by Michael Dialinus about a coroner who is, she becomes the medical examiner because she was terrified of being buried alive and wants to be the medical examiner to make sure that no one who is being buried is being buried alive i feel like this is something i would do like straight up yeah probably had this train of thought in jobs at one point <laughs> um a short story called she's got it about a woman who has sort of a breakdown while watching a quiz game show um another pinup called king of fevers by francine b uh a tease for Sort of one of the ongoing shorts in here that is by James Tynan and Ricardo Lopez Ortiz called The Adventures of Killboy. <laughs> we don't really get much more than like a two page spread teasing that one. An interview with Scott Snyder about writing horror and writing comics and how kind of all of the comics he writes, he kind of approaches the same way he would as writing a horror comic. Interesting. Um, which I think, Meg, maybe we were talking about at some point recently. Like, yeah, I was going to say that sounds familiar. How his hook into like writing the Joker is always like, what are the things that he's afraid of? A uh, Another pinup by Brian Level called Nothing to Get Hung About. A short by Sam Johns and Danny about... Uh, actually very much sort of stylistically in line with Lolo Woods, sort of like horror in nature. Uh, but, like, a lot of the visuals are the same. There are deers and things like that throughout it. Baby Blue by Trung Nguyen, which is this comic about a young woman who is on the phone while vivisecting a deer man. Okay. Um, it's, that one's kind of hard to explain. And then a piece by Ram V and John Pearson uh, called A Dream of Time, which has this, like, old school vertigo sandman feel um that is about a mesoamerican god making a man carve calendars and sort of the the like 2012 fear that because the mayan calendar is running out time is ending and how basically like just time is meaningless and maybe it's not so much that time ran out so much as just people stopped caring about time um like that it, it's it's all sorts of stuff ranging from like psychological to existential to just fun and weird um and that's that's just the first one like every issue is i think something like 80 pages long nice. and multiple teams coming in and telling the, and some of them are two three pages some of them are eight ten pages very cool yeah vampironica new blood meg this one's on you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I also meant to finish Archie versus Predator 2, which I think I started talking about last year, too. Um, they were in the same area on my bookshelf. But yeah. yeah, I didn't love the first Vampironica. Did love Vampironica versus Jughead the Hunger. Mm -hmm. This takes place after um, versus 
Jughead. And some of it's a little slow, but I'm liking where it's going. And Veronica's also dealing with the fact that hmm, I maybe kissed Jughead the hunger, which like, to be fair, werewolf Jughead's pretty hot. <laughs> and does that mean that I'm attracted to Jughead in my world? And what happens when like 80s looking vampire, like that like punk goth vampire just shows up in town and wants to be your friend? friend <laughs> and like i don't know I, I enjoyed this more um frank i always forget his last Thierry? name. Thierry. yes took over on this uh, and i think he just does these so well yeah so um it is like a tr it's a bit of a transition we get more information about the vampires in this world um and maybe there are werewolves in this world we're not sure so maybe jughead is a werewolf in this world as well um, but I, I like it. I like where it's going. Cool. Yeah. Limbo. <gasps> Limbo. <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know how we missed this book, Alex. Yeah, it, it just has to have been that, like, at that point in time, either. Because <sighs> this was 2016. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely, like, earlier days of panelology. <laughs> I was telling Alex before we started that I was reading back through some old conversations as I searched through Facebook, trying to find a link for something. And when I searched the word, it was like, oh, you said this word back in 2016. It's like, what the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> Anyways, that led to me looking at a conversation between Tim and I where he was a little too anxious to talk to you guys to tell you how much he loves panel. Oh, my things. God. And just like reflecting on how much that's changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's adorable. Yeah, now he won't return our calls. It's weird. I know. Now he's right? a big shit. Now he's too cool for us. That's fine. Mr. Vampire Dentist. Mm. <laughs> Not explaining that at all. No, nope. no just, context. Just drop that there and leave it. Yep. Limbo. Yes. Yes. Tell me about Dan it. Waters, Michael Dialinus, two creators we absolutely love. Love. Plus, this book is so like up my fucking alley. By the way, somehow yeah. I managed to read two voodoo books. I don't know how that happened. Luck of the draw? Yeah. I was just like, you know what? It's voodoo season, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So this is about a guy who has no memory. Like I said, has no memory. Um, and is he becomes a detective. <laughs> oh, <laughs> detectives too. I was really into detectives this year, I guess. Huh. So he becomes like a private eye in order to kind of work through his own shit. And ends up stumbling into a world he couldn't have imagined. Which is weird, because... <laughs> it's in his own It's mind. in his own head. The whole world is in his own head. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Adding to my list. I love the style of this book. This sort of, like... Kind of, like, every character sort of has their own general color they're drawn in. Yeah. And, like, everyone sort of stands out in that way. But also just kind of, the, which is, I think, I think normally when I picture Michael Dialinus' stuff, I picture something a little almost like more watercolor. Mm -hmm. But this is so, so neon. Yeah, this is super, That that's a good word for it. Yeah, like neon and these big blocks of color that stand out against each other. Yeah. Um, but then also just like the aesthetic of tape decks and like the way that, oh man, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, his roommate Sandy. friend Sandy thank you the way that Sandy summons is by like putting out a tape or whatever and the, the, the tape in the actual cassette unspools and takes the form of oh yeah it's so cool of whichever yeah. Loa she's trying to, to communicate with yeah oh I love or, it it's beautiful or just like the infinitely regressing TVs turned at an angle to form a pathway for people to pass through. Yeah. Yeah, I love the teleshaman. That is yeah. the coolest element. <laughs> it, he's the he's what? He is literally the the Native American chieftain head that used to be on the the t when the TV would go to sleep at night. Hello the young children. Oh my god. Yeah. There would be that and like a the horse and some other things. But he's that guy. I kind of love that. So this has to be set in the 80s then, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Like, For there to be like Betamax and VHS and 
tape decks and then the test pattern which hasn't been on since i mean the look at this the cover, early 90s i don't know as i just added it to my list it looks 80s yeah, yeah. Uh, like at latest early 90s like it cannot be any later yeah than that. there are no cds in this man's right mind, let alone <laughs> laser world. disc yeah it's so good though i love the way my mom brigitte and oh, what is his name saturday yeah the way that they are just like they're playing this game with this dude it's so good I love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I I still can't believe that we had not been aware of this book no. until now. And it's so And this weird. is also also where I'm going to mention the same creative team in December has a book coming out. <laughs> and it's going to get got. Yep. Uh what what what's it called? Homesick Pilot. And it is described as The Shining meets Power Rangers. Need it. Need it. What? Need it. What? Everything about that? I need it. Yeah. You're going to have to remind me when this comes out, because I do need this. I will. Oh, but how uh, creepy were those fucking snake mannequins? Oh, so creepy. <laughs> I was already sold on this. Oof. Just keep talking. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm here for this. Also, the, like, New Orleans marching band that takes oh. you over with their music. Oh, what? The second string or the, the second line? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to call them the Black Parade. I knew that was wrong. <laughs> They did have a very MCR aesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> Crossover where they show up in... Uh, Doom Patrol? <laughs> I was going to say um, Umbrella Academy, but yeah, oh, it's close enough. Oh, either way. I'm good with those. Oh, or, or, oh shoot, what's the... What's the My Chemical Romance album that had a comic book spinoff that has a sequel coming out starting this week? I don't fucking know. There's no way in hell I missed something, MCR. When did this happen? Okay, hang on a second. I will procure answers. Um, I mean, of anything, I would have said Helena, but... True Lives of the Fabulous Killjoys. Uh, okay. There was okay. a six-issue comic yeah. miniseries in 2013. Never mind, yeah. And there is that's a sequel to it. Because that's when I was like, uh, all right, I'm done. <laughs> There, it's very good. I've read it. Okay. <laughs> um, I read it for clearing the backlog. Uh, there is a sequel to it coming out starting this week, I think. Interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah, it is. It is. They are maybe the most Doom Patrol Umbrella Academy characters in this thing. The not the Black Parade <laughs> second string. Yeah, the second yeah. line. Second line. It's very cool. Okay, now to return to something we talked about last year. That I have read more of, finally. Yes. Gideon Falls. I love this comic so much. So I think last year I had read volume one, and Meg, you had gotten through maybe two? That is a good question. Let me see. I am through three. I started four this week, and then realized nobody else was on four, and maybe I shouldn't read that far ahead. <laughs> okay, so To then turn week, around and talk about it. Last year, Meg and I talked about volume one, and Brian talked about volume two. I think I yes, talked I a little about it, because I've read up notes. to, like, the Black Barn. Okay. I didn't have you listed in the show notes as having it, but that's cool. Yeah. It might have been in uh, December, because I definitely, like, finished volume two in December. So we might have talked about it for, like, the top, the best Oh, uh, yeah. That's very plausible. Yeah. I don't have those notes still. Um, Actually, I probably do. I was about to say, you just don't have them up. <laughs> yeah. Probably on my laptop. Let's be honest. <laughs> They're probably not on this computer. Yeah. Um, so Gideon Falls. Uh, I think since we've talked about this before, maybe once we get past premise, some spoiler talk. Uh, but this starts in this like rural town where this priest has taken a new assignment, been forced into a new assignment, after his predecessor turns up dead. And he gets there and his predecessor turns up dead again <laughs> after having murdered a woman. Yeah. Maybe. And when Father Fred finds the murdered woman's body, he also sees this big black barn that isn't there when anyone comes back and has never been there before, as far as anyone alive knows. It's Haven. Uh, it's just Haven. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is also a character in a city who has been like collecting pieces of the black barn when he finds them in garbage. And Always his therapist the is... Always wears a mask because he's a good person. He's just corpse. That's all he is. He's corpse husband. I love him. Do you guys know who corpse um, husband is? Nope. Oh. Is this any relation to corpse bride? No. No, he's a YouTuber who does like 
spooky story. He has the deepest oh, voice I've ever yeah. heard, and I love it. He does spooky stories and like music. He does music. He's been putting out AMVs with music to it, and um, lately he's been putting out gaming videos and i'm just like yes give me more content give me the deep voice <laughs> it's very soothing and he's so good at lying to people on among oh, us no. it's so funny oh no um yep this character is just like that. just like that yeah yeah i love that his first like strategy for this is pulling his therapist into it and getting her on the train yeah yeah this is a good um, way to prove you're either super crazy and enough to make your therapist crazy, or you're super <laughs> not th crazy because now your therapist can also see it. Yeah. Um. I feel like I'd be mad. I'd be like, I don't, I don't want to be in this world. What have you done? <laughs> I mean, she kind of is though, right? Yeah. Like, there's a part of where yeah. she's like, I, I've seen it. And I kind of hate everything right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, I was fine being perfectly miserable and not knowing about other miserable <laughs> things. Man, do you know how many times I've had that thought process? <laughs> A lot in 2020. Yeah. Ignorance may not be bliss, but it's better than this. <laughs> yep. Um, I want to talk about the new stuff, though. There's your general premise. Now, spoiler warning. <laughs> la, la, la. I did not clue into this at all last time. But this time rereading volume one to read two and three, like I had this errant thought, these could be alternate dimensions. Ooh. D didn't they set that up in the like first trade? Maybe the second, end of the second. You there had only are... read one. I had only read one. Okay, so it must be the and end then... of the second. Yeah. When they're like, the city is Gideon Falls. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing, like, I think, I think that that gets teased more explicitly through two, and then two does end with, like, the, there is a person who has connected the, 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 the worlds, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and made travel between them possible. Um, but there are little hooks and nudges and nods that rereading it, even without knowing that was coming, rereading it, I think, are a little more obvious, uh, in volume one. Yeah, I think five is supposed to end. I think the last issue comes out in December. Yes. Like, that's this is correct. ending this year. And it's so easy to get into because Comixology, I feel, just has these always on sale for like the back issues are always 99 cents. It's like anything that's come out in the last yep. maybe trade is like $1.50. And then, or maybe it's the previous trade. And then, like, the new, the last three issues are usually like full price. Yeah, And this is how I own all of this in, like, two different <laughs> formats, because I'm like, I could go get the trades, or I can sit on my couch and get it off Comixology and read it now, knowing that I'm eventually going to get the trades. I just got four this week. Yeah. Yeah, that is, oh boy, oh boy, I've spent, like, so I've double spent oh, so much same. in the past few months going, ooh, I want it now, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to get it, but I want it now. Yes. But I, I mention and want to talk about the alternate universes thing, because I feel like this story starts in a very, like, faith versus science kind of place, and in a very, like, small town place, mm -hmm. that you don't see a lot of hard sci-fi parallel world stuff build off of. And I think it's a really cool, like, angle to come into that. Yeah. Because you get, you get the first hints at that through other than learning that that the city is also called Gideon Falls. Um, like the first times you really see it, you see Father Fred like having these memories of decades earlier before he was ever in the town of like what turns out to be like small town gossip and rumor and legend and sort of building these weird small town rumors into. Oh, well, no, shit's weird, and there's this demon dude who smiles through reflective surfaces and lives between all the dimensions, maybe, and wants <sighs> to use people as his doorway? That smile. Mm, that smile. That <laughs> thing gives me that, man. He's right there with the Upside Down Man in yep. uh, Justice League Dark. Terrifying. Uh, not what I was thinking of, but yes. Sure. Um, but, like, I like that sort of building in on small town paranoia. And turning that into something like weird and cosmic and sci-fi. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. I think it's a it is a swift turn on what they usually do with 
small town horror, which is usually like some kind of satanic cults. Yay! <laughs> yeah. Um, the third volume of this spends most of its time following a character who we've only heard on the phone uh, in the first two volumes. Ooh. And like, it definitely feels like a middle act in the overall thing. Like, it's kind of actually a weird one to have stopped on. <laughs> Like, I really want to go read four now. Yeah, like, I picked up four because I was going to go through all of this and was like, oh, yeah, I've read this within the last year, forgetting that 2020 has really been like 10 years. And was like, <laughs> at least I don't I don't actually remember where three ends. I don't I don't like I remember as I'm looking at this, I'm like something big happened, but I I don't have enough of a grasp to be as invested in this as i know i should be which is not to say anything against the comic it is entirely like i needed to sit down and reread volumes one through three because yeah. it's so good and it's so twisty and turny and the art on this is just so great i love andrea sorrentino so much it's just all slightly off kilter all very sinister and just the red squares. That's like that's what I'm always gonna take yeah. from this. I love the way in flashbacks that he like simplifies his art style too. Yes. Where it feels it feels a little more innocent and not as like creepy and encroaching. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Everybody should read this, especially because it is ending this year. Like I yeah. It's going to yeah. end. So it's not like if you jump on now, you're gonna be like, damn, I just started this in the middle of something. And I am gonna have a long time before I get relief. I don't. I don't know if this has any kind of TV or whatever. Like it could be TV, it could be movie. But I, I would love to see this adapted. I was thinking that too because I think it would be really great. But I feel like these like really obscure horror comics are a little harder to translate into TV. And like the the one I'm thinking of is is Outcast. Um, which I started, but my issue with Outcast is that the comic also moves really slow because I feel like that's like nine volumes in, and I'm still like, you haven't even like said the problem. I feel like that's so much easier to consume in comic books than it is in TV. Agree, because yeah. that's can... why I think Outcast. I think it only had two seasons before. Yeah. It. So it's like I want this as a TV show as well, but I feel like it either needs to come after something else succeeds. Or it's not going to get enough traction. That's fair. Unless the people who created Evil take this on. <laughs> damn, I love that show. I need to watch that show. Oh, oh my God. Oh. You need to. and You need to watch it through once. And then you need to watch it through a second time for all the little things. Because there's like puzzle pieces that flash. And it's, oh, it's so good. I've watched that show so many times. <laughs> also, Luke Cage, just to bring it back to comics. Oh, oh God, yes. He's <laughs> such a pretty man. Punk Mambo. This is my other voodoo book. <laughs> so this is a valiant book and if you know anything about me um that's really atypical for me that's true but it's cullen i know that about you. but it's cullen bun so i was gonna read it um and i'm actually glad i did because it was really i i wasn't sure how cullen bun was gonna do with something that he didn't create because i haven't read hardly anything of his that's not creator owned i've read probably about half and half and usually his creator owned is the strongest. oh boy work. it's so good and i say that as someone who actually really likes his aquaman run oh yeah i have read that okay this book is about a um an immortal young mambo or a voodoo priestess who is having to save all the different loa so she has the ability to use her talisman and summon different Loa to help her fight things, solve problems, other things like that. Um, and she was kind of turned into a mambo against her will. She became a voodoo priestess because someone used her in a ritual uh, to gain immortality. And then she ended up turning that against him and gaining immortality herself. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> um, and she's English. She's an English punk. That's why it's punk mambo cool yeah um but it's it's really good like it was really good the villain is somebody who is the son of a, a mambo and a hongan so he 
should have all of these really awesome powers, but instead he's like a power vacuum. Hmm. No one can use any sort of powers around him. So it's it, it, his plot is to uh, sort of bring all of the different Loa into himself and become the most powerful thing ever. And Punk Mambo's like, eh, I mean, you could do that, but you, uh, I'll just kill you. It's fine. <laughs> it's really good. I enjoyed it a lot. Cool. Vampire State Building. Please tell me about this. I have this book and I want to read it. Okay. So I'm going to start off with a very, like, big caveat. Um, I really enjoyed this. However, it takes, it uses Native American kind of tropes that I feel like we could have done without. And I don't think that they, I, I, I worry about the message within that. It's a very strange um vibe like mm, the vampires have... are because of some like native american culture uh slash cults and i feel like you could have done this and it didn't have to be native american so that is my caveat for this outside of that man imagine getting trapped in the empire state building with a bunch of fucking vampires <laughs> <laughs> and having to like i don't know try to figure out how to get out when you're at the, like, observatory level, which is, I'm trying to remember what floor, but I, I think 85 is the one you stop on first. So, so no, maybe like, it is It's on like the, the top, top 10 floors, right? Yeah, something like that. I've done this one time, and it was, like, seven or eight years ago. Um, and basically, there is this, we're going to call it cult because it has evolved out of the Native American whatever culture and they build these really tall buildings so that they can put these boxes of these like vampire masters in the building to maybe bring a chaos and hell on earth i need to reread this i like i already know i do because i like sped through the last one and i like that concept of like we're creating all these really tall buildings so that we can destroy the earth the vampire master has a little bitty mouth all over his body. He has a little bitty what? Little bitty mouth. Mouth. Like little bitty fang mouth. No. It's 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 creepy as fuck. And at <laughs> one really... point they all bleed. No. And I'm like, oh, this is so gross and wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> the basic story of it I think is a little um basic. But I really like the fact I like the idea behind it and I like the concept of being trapped in the Empire State Building, something that, like, it's not necessarily, like, a beacon of light or anything, but it's something, like, that we're kind of proud of that yeah. it's a country, or at least, like, maybe as a state. Um, as producers it, of 90s rom-coms. That as well, yes. And how quickly that becomes, like, a death trap coffin. Um, and how do you kill vampires? Also vampires that maybe can control weather. Ooh, wait, hold on. <laughs> so, are, wait... Uh, so what kind of Native American lore is this? I, it is, I can't remember which tribe it was, but it, they, it's like one tribe wrote about another tribe that may be cannibalists, also maybe translates to vampires, and all of them talk in this dead language of a Native American tribe that used to be on New York land hmm. hundreds of years ago because they have to bring in someone who, uh, a professor of linguistics to kind of translate it and all so, this stuff. So this is all in all very Algonquin- Yes. Okay. Yes. And it, I mean, I'm it intrigued. is a, like it, that all made me pause because I'm like, I don't know if this is commentary on like, get the fuck off my land or if this is like negative um, publicity for Native American culture. There is like an actual word for that that I'm totally blanking on. If it's really insensitive or not. Like, I don't know which way this leads because <laughs> it's only five ish, four issues. And and a lot happens within those four issues. But I really like the idea of a really intelligent vampire. And maybe it's kind of like a hive mind, too. Um, because they, like, burn the shit out of some vampires. Which may be why the master vampire is like, I'm going to create a hurricane. What? <laughs> I'm so intrigued. At one point, they're like, there's this massive, like, category four hurricane coming in from Long Island. And I'm like, What? <laughs> 
I am mostly surprised we made it into this this far into the episode before there was a book that just sounds like a fever dream <laughs> to explain. Oh boy. That's because we weren't doing a good job of explaining some of the others. <laughs> that may be true. <laughs> I, I felt like this. Uh, so this is done by the guy who did The Walking Dead. Um, and I, I felt this like is a Kirkman? It, this is Kirkman? Um, maybe it's, I think it's the artist. Or, oh, it okay. might be the artist. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All I know is that the first issue I have is Creator of The Walking Dead. I was like, I brought another, I bought another Kirkman book? There's no way. Um, it feels very much like... It, it, it is a contained story, and it could very easily be made into, like, a horror movie that I think would do fairly well. As long so. as they're careful with it. Yeah, as long as, yeah, like, that line, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I need someone else to read it to help me figure out how I'm supposed to feel here, I guess. Because <laughs> I am not sure. I would say I'll do that, but I don't think I can help you figure out how you should feel about this. <laughs> I, I might even have questions as well. Yes. But just... Because part of me was like, oh, no, I don't know if I like this, but I really like this, like, really horrific vampire master that has little bitty mouths all over him. It's so gross. <laughs> I don't like it. It's like a line of it. It's, and then at one point you see, like, his calf and it's like, oh, no, it goes down to his feet. Cool. Cool. Wait, he has mouths on his feet? It Like, Can on his absorb- leg. Oh, okay. I don't know Toe if they're mouth. on his feet. I thought, I thought you were going to say he could absorb nutrients through his feet. No, I don't think he's quite an Andalite yet. <laughs> Give him time. Yes. yes. Okay, Nailbiter returns. So, I sat down and read this all together again, even though, like, have done the single issues and stuff. And it flows so well. And I just... Yeah. I love this stupid town that produces stupid serial killers. <laughs> And these stupid serial killers popping back up, maybe, and also maybe two of them getting married, and also that, like, their tradition is to try to scare each other every night, and I just fucking love this stupid That's fucking adorable. (laughs) And also am a little concerned about my mental health, as I'm like, man, Nailbiter's still hot. Ah, god dang it. And then Nailbiter gets a beard, and I'm like, damn it. No. Don't, yeah. I can't think he's hot, too. Yeah, he gets, like, a full-on great lumberjack beard. Oh, no. And, like, at one point, he's like, I have to tell you something. I'm so glad we're rocking the beards at the same time. And I'm like, damn it! I love him so much. <laughs> and then he's in the full FBI SWAT gear with his fingers out, like, their guns, which I know we talked about this briefly, but it's still my favorite scene of, like, anything recently. It's, where he, like, it's the best. Bust in to help save the day. And it's like, you have no weapons. You literally have your fingers out like they are guns. <laughs> and yet still intimidated. Oh, yes. Very much so. It's weird that I want to live in Buckaroo, right? I mean, a little I, bit, I, I, like I, on brand. I would like totally on brand, but a little split, bit. Split like a cabin there with you, where like we could go stay in the summers. I don't think I could do year round. Okay, but that may also be because it's like in a weather spot. I don't really particularly want to go like sit in the cold. Oh, I do. I love cold. <laughs> I don't have a whole lot to add. I'm still loving it. I'm glad we get more nail biter. Also, I feel like if we live in a world where we're getting more Dexter, <gasps> then someone should be making a Nailbiter TV show. And I say that yes. as someone who actually liked the second half of Dexter. I would watch the shit out of a Nailbiter TV show. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Like, that would have so much tongue-in-cheek and would be a great... I, I, it would be so good. Yeah. Need it. This might be the comic I want to see the most as a TV show. Yes. Now I'm sitting here going, who can play Nails? Oh, uh, I want Philadelphia to be a TV show, and you guys need to read it. Hurry up. Come on. Okay. But I, okay, it, but enough. it's because I want the guy from Lovecraft Country to be Jim Jr. So bad. The guy who plays Tick? Yes. I love I him. also just want him in everything. You he know, he's, 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 he's the King the Conqueror. Yes. Okay, yes. Yes. He completed a detective in Neil Biter. Finch? Oh. Yes. Yeah. I'd watch that. Yes. Just just put him in everything, and I'm exactly. happy. Exactly. I am, too. Yeah. I need to finish Lovecraft Country. Yeah, I'm a little behind on it, too. Also, Journey Smollett in everything. everything. Oh, in everything. Everything. She can act Obligatory circles around musical everything. Number. No. Yes. Yes. I mean, like, I, I like when she has a musical number, but I don't need it. 
I need She's it. good enough without it. She is but good enough even without Even better it. with. It depends on the thing. Yeah, I'm going to have to second that. Yeah. <sighs> Look, in my world, everything's a musical. I can understand that sentiment. Your world is but so will... cute. <laughs> it is. We will move on to the plot. Yes. Jin. Yes. I'm not I'm not upset that I had you read this one. <laughs> I'm not either. Cuz I love it and it's Michael Morisi and it's Vault. So, yep. you know, all all those good good things together. This takes place in the 70s. Yes, 1973? 4. 4. 4. I think. Um if you like The Haunting of Hill House and consequently the Bly Manor, of course, you will love this book. This is so very Hill House esque. Yeah, I love it. I know. Add it to my. It made me think of the first like couple of episodes of the Netflix adaptation of October Faction. I have not watched that yet. I enjoyed it. I feel like it's tonally very different from the comic. Okay, I kind of got that from also, the previews, a- and I was like, "Ooh, I don't know." Also, it's not getting a second season, so. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, that. then never mind. Me too. Then never mind. Um, but this book, uh, it's, uh there's a, a monster happening and a haunted house and creepy children. Well, they're not creepy. The children aren't so creepy. There are children in creepy situations. Yes, which is it always makes situations creepier. And a Truth. black sheep of the family uncle. It's just good stuff. Yeah, his childhood sweetheart, maybe? Uh, I mean, kind of, I guess. Almost? It seems like nothing actually ever... Oh, wait, no, it did, because she definitely said that they used to fuck. (laughs) I don't know where you were going with that, but I definitely didn't just expect you to be like, they used to fuck. Yeah. Well, I mean, she does say, well, we did used to. Yeah. A long time ago. Indeed. It's been like 15 she years. She hasn't thought of him lately at all. <laughs> I feel like that's a lie. I definitely think that's a lie. <laughs> I think it's more of a every second of every day. Oh yeah. man, I feel that. But uh, I am I am here for this spoopy house where every time something weird happens, whatever room they're in floods with bog water. Oh, it's so weird. It's so weird. I love it. It's- and it's it's not even the house. Like Even when they're in the school listening to this old tape recording... On, like, a reel-to-reel, a light bulb starts flooding yeah. and then shorts out and bursts. So, it's, like, so specific and weird. Yeah, so that those elements, like, when they're at school and, and, and a creepy lady in a red dress pops up out in the field outside, shit like that, that reminds me so much of The Haunting of Hill House. A- and every time there's a new panel, there's something in the background of the house. Yeah. There's... Oh, I don't even think I caught everything that's in the background <laughs> of all these panels. It's so terrifying. That stuff fucking gets me. Yeah. It fucking wrecks my nerves. But I love it. <laughs> like, almost a little It follows you, right? Like, oh, you're yeah. always looking on the horizon for the thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, man, now I need to watch that again. Yeah. It doesn't help. Like, I don't, I don't know if I fully believe in ghosts. I'm always kind of that person that's like, there's... There's probably an explanation for the weird shit that's happening. It's ghosts. That's the it's, explanation. It's ghosts. So lately, um, I was seeing this little, like, tiny black cat-looking thing out of the corner of my eye every now and then in my house. And then Mike said something about it. I hadn't said anything to anybody. And he said, so I think I've been seeing a ghost cat. And I'm like, no. Me too. <laughs> so we're we're probably haunted by a ghost cat. Um... This is not some kind of elaborate Halloween prank, right? Like, no, do, do no. cups keep just falling off the table for no reason? Some, uh, not the table, and not cups, but little things off of. Mm-hmm. Ca- but we do have two other cats. Mm, but, yeah, but see, I feel like they, you'd be like, they I have see you two non ghost cats. We have, we, have, we have two regular cats, two ordinary <laughs> alive cats, and they're both black. So it was like maybe I'm just seeing one of those. But then <laughs> you're not. I was laying in bed. One night, and I had two dogs and two cats on me, and I could hear a cat playing in the hallway, and I was like, mm, nope, that that's a ghost, ghost cat. cat. You do have a ghost cat. Yeah, and the dogs were, like, chasing something around the room, and it wasn't either of the cats. Mm, nope. So, it was probably a ghost cat. I told the ghost cat that it has to sleep in the window at night, um, if it wants to stay in this house, and that's, it has been. Well, that's good. So, 
As far as I know, the the dogs haven't been chasing anything around the bedroom. So, have have you offered hey. it any fish jerky? No, but I would. If it's... Kitty Cat wants fish jerky, it can have it. I affectionately call it Ghost Cat. I think that's a good name. Yeah. 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 What's really freaky is that we have these like paintings of these 1920s ladies. And one of them is like holding a champagne glass with a fur draped around her. And the other one has this like pearl headdress thing and is holding a, a little black cat. And I was like, that's that cat. Ha- has the cat gone missing from the painting? Because I feel like that's what usually happens. <laughs> no, but I only see this painting during the day, so... Oh, oh, mm, yep, okay. <laughs> Who knows? I'm not going to look at it at night. I know the rules. <laughs> I don't read from the book. I'm not I do. too far into Bly Manor. Ooh, girl. But the entire first episode, I spent the, sitting there going, Turn on a fucking light. <laughs> Let me just wander around this house that I don't know. Oh my gosh. On the first night here, after a creepy child has told me to stay in my bedroom at right. night. If a small child says something like that, let me tell you what, I'm going to stay in my bedroom. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> Even also, if it like, means, like, they could kill me. They, the small child could kill yeah. me in the middle of the night. I'm locking that fucking door. Yeah. But, and yeah. And she's just sitting there twiddling her thumbs, wide awake in bed with no lights on. I'm sorry. As someone who sleeps with the TV on, I don't understand this mentality. Oh, yeah, same. Well, I don't sleep with it on, but I, like, put the little timer on. Um, I've been listening to Scared to Death a lot recently, which is a podcast <laughs> about spoopy stuff. I <laughs> I try to fill a lot of my gaps here with weird spoopy things, apparently. Uh, but they it's were the year? two hosts were talking about um, whether you're a lights on, every light on you have to see everything person when you get spooked or if you're a cover over the head turn all the lights off person and i'm like who is that who 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 tries to ignore it now what if you tend to 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 exist in dark spaces but also are easily not spooked maybe but startled to the point where i don't know you catch a hand towel hanging on your wall in your bathroom that you were just drying your hands on out of the corner of your eyes and jump a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm kind of... But you still, like, in the middle of the night will decide you want a glass of water and, like, leave every light in the house off as you traipse into the kitchen. Who are you, you monster? Let me tell you, okay. So I went from 500 square feet, and even in 500 square feet, one, there was always a light on in the living room, or in the hallway... So that it was shining in the living room's kitchen hallway area. Yeah. And two, I had a nightlight in the bathroom, but that is also because the the, the light burned out in the bathroom and it was too short to change it. Oh. That being said, there was always at least two lights on in the house. Yeah, I'm a nightlight person. I like to have a power. Yeah. So Mostly I because move. I'm clumsy and I stub my toes Same. a lot. Same. So I move. I have 1,600 square feet now, which includes a second bedroom and a loft. And a living room that has such high wall ceilings that I really can't get it quite bright enough for what I want at night, mm, which always, is fine. Always that vignette darkness yeah. over your head. Ooh, yeah. I don't love. I don't love. And, and it's, been a mo- it's been a little bit of an adjustment where I'm like, mm, this house is a lot darker than I want it to be. But mm-hmm. also, I cannot bring myself to turn on every single light. That being said, there is a light that stays on in my office and the light above the stove stays on. All the time. And one in the living room. We keep a general amount of light. If you gotta get out of bed. Because it doesn't help that I have the, like, security system from hell. That at 4am it just just lets out this really loud pitch. No. Can't figure out what it's doing. But I'm also... That's your ghost detector. Yeah, for real. You should... It's... I'm like... Maybe call a priest. Um... (laughs) Yeah, can't find anybody who put it in. Can't find the cord that they keep telling me that I should cut to just turn it off. And, um... Yeah, so the first night that I was like, oh, I don't have enough lights on to go turn this off because it's next to a stairwell that goes up to a loft that has the creepy off or space that I'm currently recording in. Um, yeah, anyways, my apartment scares me a little bit. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. It's fine, but it scares me a little bit. What were we talking about? The plot. Oh, right. <laughs> what scary was the houses. plot? Got it. Yeah, it is, it is a I've scary added house. This to my list. It's very good. Because and there's more than definitely. one volume, so sweet. There was only one volume I saw on. Yeah, it, I, I don't think the second one has come out, but like yeah, the second I've... amount of books okay. I think has come out. 
Gotcha. Tim Daniel Which... and Michael Morrissey. Maurice, 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 Maurice yep. okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. We also have a pair of number ones that we're going to hit on quickly because we've talked about them on regular episodes. At least I have. Stillwater, number one. Stillwater, number Chip one. Chip Starsky. Great. great. That good, good chipper boy. I am so bummed you have not read this, Jim. I am too. Honestly, honestly, both of these books we're about to talk about are so much your shit. <laughs> like, of all the things that I have read or listened to or watched in the past few months, what is wrong with me? I mean, this is a book about a, like, snarky jackass who gets a letter from a creepy delivery man oh, saying no. that he's inherited shit in a town that doesn't exist no, no, on no. a map. I, something along the lines of, I think I found the right timeline or something to deliver this letter. Like, the way that he phrases this, I was like, um, what? And even the guys it was, that get it, they're like, mm, this is the start of a horror movie vibe. Cool. <laughs> yeah. It was very like, take the end of Back to the Future when the Pony Express dude shows up. Mm -hmm. It's like that, but with a couple of jackass dude bros in a horror comic. But that aesthetic. Need it. Um, and yeah, they, they find this town where nobody can die. And immediately learn this secret that nobody can die. So the sheriff drags them just out past the edge of the town so he can kill them. <laughs> yep. End Cute. of book one. Cute. Yeah. Uh, the other one I wanted to mention is the autumnal, which I had pestered Brian to read. Dang it. And did not remember to harass either of you to read to talk about on this episode. So that's So on this me. didn't come out this week? No, okay. this came out three weeks ago, okay. maybe. The second issue isn't out yet. Uh, this is another vault book um, about a, like, the phrase oppositional defiance disorder comes to mind when I think of the main character of this and her kid. Like, they just have to push against both of them. Okay. Like, wherever there are rules, wherever there are norms, like, they just have to kind of scratch the blackboard in protest. Um, so, punk, but to a... To a ooh, to the nth degree, yeah, a little bit. Um, end up going back to creepy hometown where, like, the fall foliage is beautiful. It's great ooh. for leaf peeping. Um, because the main character's mother has died, oh. and like everyone is super sketchy and like trying to get them just to leave, and no one will explain how her mother has died. And then, like, the last shot of the first issue is this just, like, there is, she's turning, like, has turned in, the, 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 the mother, we see the mother's corpse, and she, like, has, like, a tree growing out of her, or maybe has turned <laughs> into some sort of tree. All those beautiful leaves you've been looking at. Oh, no. Yeah, like, definitely don't know what the fuck is up, but something is the fuck up. Mm -hmm. So, these will be the books that next year we're like, did we talk about the first issue of the first <laughs> year? Yes. Yes, we yes. did. Um, so, in the category of deeply horrifying, I received a message, clearly from some kind of, I don't know, deranged maniac, challenging me to open door number three. This oh, week. no. Oh, no. I'm so scared. What? So that's right. We have a long box book report. Oh no. Oh no. This week's book focuses on the Let's see if either of you can guess this. I absolutely was not able to. This week's book focuses on the frailty of mankind in a very public venue. This message read, "Just how many things can go wrong in a single book?" Bill Cullen, Bob Barker, and Drew Carey would appreciate the irony of what is hidden behind door number three. Is there any chance our heroes will obtain their loot at the end of their many misadventures? Are you prepared to peek at the mayhem behind door number three? Do you know which book this is? I mean... No. Yeah, no, no one's gonna guess. Is it. there a Price is Right comic? No. <laughs> That's what I thought. Um, no. There is not. But there is 1982's the ori the official Marvel no prize book number one. Oh no! Wow. Which is a collection narrated by Stan Lee of various typos and art errors 
throughout Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the very first example of which is in Amazing Fantasy number 15, Peter Parker was named Peter Palmer. Then again, then in Amazing Spider-Man 1, he was Peter Parker. Then in Amazing Spider-Man number 3, at one point, Dr. Octopus calls him Superman. Oh. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, there are two issues of Tales to Astonish in which Betsy Ross is called Betty Brandt. Um, an entire issue of X-Men where Angel is called Scott. That is, and I these mean, are like, book is, these are published books too. Like yes. they came out like this. These are real mistakes. And <laughs> the, like each page of this is just. The panels where it happened and editorial boxes explaining that the mistakes happened. Not <laughs> why, not making any kind of excuse. Just, yep. How about Hawkeye's powerful gloved hands? Hawkeye doesn't wear gloves. He never has. Ever. But there it is in Tales of Suspense number 57. <laughs> are they there or are they not? They're not. He's drawn with bare hands and like purple wrist gauntlets. <sighs> Well, is, are there um, any like editorial boxes that say, "Yep, I got fucking nothing here"? I don't know. <laughs> I just, I don't, uh, I don't know. I mean, they all kind of have that spirit. For instance, like the time Reed was Reed Richards was drawn with two hands on his arms, and a right foot, and another hand on his left foot. What the fuck? <laughs> how? Or how, that was somebody. How? That was somebody how? knowing that their editor doesn't catch shit. That's what that yeah. was. They were yeah, like, "I'm gonna see what I can a- get away with." I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna be like, "Hey, you asshole! You didn't catch this!" And then the editor pissed him off another way, and they were like, "Just kidding! We're gonna let this go print." <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's a little more understandable. Like an issue of of Tales of Suspense number seventy four ends with Captain America pulling a cord on his parachute. At the beginning of Tales of Suspense number seventy five, he has no parachute and is falling to his doom. Oh. <laughs> it must have gotten tangled and he cut it away uh, in Marvel team up number 28 I'm not reading all these I'm just seeing some highlights Hercules drags the island of Manhattan which assumes Manhattan floats and isn't attached to the ground through the narrows which is smaller than the island is wide <laughs> and then he puts it back with the battery pointing toward the Bronx okay um, I know obviously what the battery Captain- is but man I had a moment of going is Manhattan battery powered? Hold on a second. <laughs> Jesus. Meg, Obviously, you haven't been Captain... back that long. You can't claim. I, no, like I it, both. There was half my brain that was like a oh, battery park. Cool. And the other half going battery powered. What are we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's an issue of the Hulk in which Captain Barracuda obviously has no trouble looking through his periscope periscope with the eye that has an eye patch over it. <laughs> I love seeing shit like that, especially in like older TV shows. You're like, you got an eye patch, honey. Yep. Sue Storm is described as invincible in Fantastic Four number one, <laughs> but in Thor one sixty one, Ego tells Galactus that he's not as envi- not as invisible as he seems. All right. <laughs> uh, my favorite Charles Xavier is a jerk moment. Um, in X-Men 17, Professor Xavier telepathically warns a bedridden beast not to let the doctors find out his secret identity, and then calls him by his last name out loud. What a fucking moron. See, there's an issue of Daredevil where he's got a gun and a holster on his, uh, costume. Uh, various times that Captain America's shield has been broken and then mysteriously back a few panels later. Uh, apparently the Inhumans have been in the... Himalayas, the Andes, uh, and the Alps before being on the moon, just inconsistently. Okay. Um, lots and lots. Uh, several times the name Pharaoh has been misspelled on covers of issues. <laughs> and I will stop with my favorite example here. A typo of the, the classic Marvel team-up series. This one presented The Thing and The Man Thing. That's Marvel 2 on 1. Oh my god. Yeah. So so Um, this book should just be called You Had One Job. (laughs) Pretty much. 
Pretty much. Um, the greatest horror is having to edit comics. <laughs> I've learned my lesson, Scrooge. All right, before we wrap it up, any non-comics horror stuff to recommend? I think I've pretty much been doing that this whole time. <laughs> That's fair. Shit. Hang on. I'm you sure I can find several other things. Uh, I am going to say Mexican Gothic. Ooh, yeah. Especially if you read and enjoyed Lolo Woods. I started that this week. I feel... Yeah? yeah. What you think Ooh, so I love far? it. All right, it's if so you've good. started it, then I have no excuse. I have to also start <laughs> For it. real? Come on. <laughs> Oh. Um, I feel like it comes from a very similar kind of place as Lolo Woods. Yeah. So I will I will make that comparison. Um, and I would love to see Sylvia Moreno Garcia do a comic for like Vault or someone. Mm-hmm. Like as much as her world building is like scenic description, yeah. I'd love to see it. Mm-hmm. I need it. I need it. You know they're doing a TV ad- adaptation of that. I did not. Yep. I'm excited. Okay. I pulled up my book. I was like, I don't remember what I've read this year. (laughs) There is The Sundown Motel, if you like ghost stories, especially stories that go across time. It is about a girl whose mom just died, so she decides to investigate the motel her aunt worked at when she went missing and also ghosts. Mm-hmm. Um, I went through a bit of a um, Agatha Christie's and then there were none retelling um, Six Wakes and Unwanted Guest and Even If We Break are the ones I read there and when no one is watching there's an entire episode on how much I love this fucking book which is essentially Rear Window meets Get Out Nice, and that's I'm what I've this. read in maybe the last three months very cool Oh, and then Riley Sager's Home Before Dark. If you want to read about a girl who grew up with, like, okay, imagine the kids from Amityville Horror and growing up and being like, my fucking dad wrote this book about our haunted house and this is what I have to live with. That's what she lives with. And then her dad dies and she inherits the house. No, thank you. Actually, I would love to live in a haunted house. I, I, I don't know. I Yes, but no. I mean, I don't want, like, poltergeist activity and a a, a a ghost that's gonna touch me no thank you please don't maybe just some ghost cat yeah i like i like my ghost cat if <laughs> we move go. and ghost cat wants to come with us that's totally fine i made my ghost stay in new york i was like <laughs> you cannot come no you knock paintings off the wall you hide my keys you stay yeah that's not a nice <laughs> ghost no all right i think that will do it for us unless anyone wants to promote things I mean, Meg. You had two weeks of me <laughs> promoting shit. It's all still the same. Go check out <laughs> everything I'm on and have fun with that. Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> In that case, we would like to thank Chase Parker for our intro voiceover. You can visit us at panelologypodcast.com. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash panelology. Get merch at bit.ly slash panelology merch, capital P, capital M. Or submit questions, comments, or whatever at bit.ly slash panelology mailbag i'm alex i'm megan and i'm jenna oh brian's not here go read comics